everyone, and welcome to Ski and Learn 2022. We will be starting shortly. See you soon.
Good evening, everyone. We're ready to start. Thank you for your patience. I just want to welcome everyone to the third presentation for See and Learn 2022. Let's give it applause. Give it a hand. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for coming. And now I will just introduce. So let's start, go back. So we have many ways for you to contribute to See and Learn 2022. You can support one of our sponsors or you can write a review on this website that we are on. Let me make sure you guys can see it. Okay, as well, while we figure that out, we'd also like to thank Carib Trans for broadcasting our live stream for tonight. We would not be able to have a live stream without them, so let's give a round of applause for Carib Trans. Thank you very much. And we also have some raffles on sale. If you guys haven't heard about that yet, I'm sure you have already. But we have raffle tickets on sale for $5. We have many, many different prizes, such as a Lombada cruise for two in St. Martin. We have a six dive day boat trip. We also have three nights at the Spyglass Villa. Really fun, cool tennis lessons from Lynn. We have a lot, a lot of cool prizes, a lot of things for you guys to check out. And those tickets will be on sale the entire presentation if you guys are interested, okay? We have many different field projects coming up. As well, the presenter for tonight, Allison Robertson, will be doing a field project tomorrow, and you guys can also sign up for that dive. Thank you. Well, these are one of the gifts and prizes for the raffle that we're having at the Hidden Gardens College. Oh, and actually, this is the host. They're hosting our presenter for the night. Um, the Hidden Garden Cottage is where they're staying for the night. It's a very, very beautiful cottage. You guys should all check it out. So let's give a round of applause for our, our sponsor for tonight. Thank you. We would also like to thank the Prince Bernard Culture Funds and the public entity SABA for sponsoring us as well. We cannot get a lot of things done without them. So give her a round of applause for them as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And we have many, many different sponsors, right? Over 50 different companies. And we just want to say a big thank you to everyone. We really, really appreciate it. This is the website that I was telling you about, Great Nonprofit. You can put a review on the website. It will really, really help us out a lot. You can support us as well by supporting the sponsors, going to one of those restaurants, seeing that they support us. It'll be really great for you guys to support them as well. And for the raffle tickets, like I was telling you guys, $5, they'll be on sale the entire presentation. And these are our upcoming events. As I was saying, tomorrow we have a field project with Allison. Thursday, October 7th at the Ecolage, we have another presentation. 3 p.m. on Friday, October 8th at Shea Bubba will be another presentation. So just really check it out. You guys can always come by the tent um, that we have at the trail shop. We'll be there from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Okay, so correction, the present presentation for Friday will be at Shea Booba, since Ecolage isn't ready yet. So just so you know, it'll be at Shea Booba on Friday, okay? And now to introduce our presenter for tonight. What do our first three experts all have in common? Besides being marine biologists, of course. Anyone know? Beautiful. <laughs> besides being beautiful and besides being marine biologists, what else do you think they have in common? Well, they all attended James Cook University for their PhDs. Small world, right? Yeah. Our expert tonight, Dr. Allison Robertson, focuses on understanding the biological role and environmental drivers of natural marine toxins in marine microalgae and the mechanisms by which they exert their effects in other marine organisms. Over the past decade, Allison's major focus has been on unraveling the complexity of ciguatera poisoning, which is one of the most prevalent seafood-borne illnesses globally 
and affects coastal communities in the tropics and subtropics and well as more temperate zones that rely on fishes from these warmer regions. Allison is a graduate coordinator for a master's program in environmental toxicology at University of Southern Alabama. Go USA! <laughs> and has brought some of her team with her to Sabre. Can we get you guys to stand up? These are her beautiful, marvelous students. So, without further ado, let's welcome Allison Robertson and her crew. Let's give it up. All right. Thank you. If I thought it was me and my crew, I would have split things up with them and they could have done a minute each. We could have had like a whole thing going. I'm just, do you want me to do something? I'm loud enough as it is, probably. What about now? <laughs> kind of scared to talk in it. I think it's okay, it's just loud. Yeah? All right, okay. All right, we're a bit skewed to the side on the screen, but can we shimmy that up? Do the shimmy? Just a little. There you go. Perfect. Awesome. All right, so hi. <laughs> I'm Alison. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm really thankful um, that we got the opportunity to be here. So thank you, See and Learn, for um, bringing us or inviting me and so that I could bring my team. I'm supposed to be teaching this week, but um, I just decided to bring my class with me, so they're pretty happy about that as well. <laughs> it's not a bad way instead of the classroom. Um, yeah, but today we're going to talk a little bit about ciguatera poisoning or ciguatera fish poisoning. People would have um, called it that in the past. But have any of you heard of that? Yeah. yeah, quite a few people. Have anybody had ciguatera? Nobody. Interesting. I've met quite a few people here on Sabre that have had ciguatera. So um, there are a few people around. Um, it's pretty, pretty common um, throughout um, the tropics um, and subtropics around the world. But um, we see that that's expanding and we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, so here we have a beautiful reef, like reefscape here, dominated by macroalgae on the bottom. We've got some gorgonians and other nice things um, going on in the picture. But um, a lot of all of the fuzzy stuff um, is what we're interested in. And actually not that interested in that, but we're interested in the organisms that live on it and use it as habitat. Oh, I'm going the wrong way again. We'll get it right. I'm from the opposite side of the world, so things go upsy down sometimes. Um, I just wanted to introduce uh, or mention um, some of our collaborators on this work. So we do work all over the world, in, and we're really lucky to be able to do that. But we can't do it alone. So I have lots of other investigators that have been involved in this work, um, from University of Texas, Woods Hole o Oceanographic, Florida Gulf Coast University, and the University of the Virgin Islands, and many, 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 many others um, throughout the world. Um, this is my, my lab team, my awesome group here, that I couldn't um, do any of the work without them, honestly. So I might as well not show up to work if they weren't there because they help me with every aspect of what we do. And this is my current team, but the team has been over the last 10 years, like 40 or 50 different people. Um, so it's been a pleasure to um, have them be a part of the research and a part of my life, I guess. Um, and the, um, along the bottom here, we have, um, well, I'll just mention Liz, who's here in the audience. She's my lab manager. Sean Collins, a graduate student, he's here as well. And then um, along the bottom, I have other students. Uh, Rachel is a master's student that's working on um, some of these issues. Kaylee Horn, right here from Woods Hole Oceanographic. Um, she's a technician there. And then we have Giacomo Allison. 
and Leia, who are all um, in my class. So they're here, they're learning about environmental toxicology and risk communication and those kinds of things. Adam couldn't make it. He's actually um, lab manager of Vesta Field Station, which is in Benito Springs in Florida Gulf Coast. University in Fort Myers, so they got hit by a hurricane recently. So we're, you know, thinking of all of them and Rachel was lucky to make it because um, she's from the same place. Anyway, moving on. This is what we're here to talk about. So sometimes we go to a restaurant, we order the, the special, right? We're going to order the fish on the menu and it's delicious. We love it. It's awesome. We have a really nice meal. And then, then you think, hmm, am I going to have dessert? It's been about 15, 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes. You're like, I don't feel so good. This isn't going well. What's going on? Right? And within 15 to 30 minutes, you can start to feel the effects of ciguatera poisoning if the fish was contaminated with the toxins. And that happens a lot. So um, it's estimated to, that there's 50 to uh, 100,000 cases per year um, throughout the United States um, and throughout the Caribbean. So that, that ends up being estimated between 5 and 12% of coastal communities that rely on um, fish as th you know, in their diet. So it's a significant problem, but, but my story here is not to say don't eat the fish. You've got to eat the fish and support the fishermen and support the fisheries in a sustainable way. But you've got to ask about the fish. You've got to know what you're eating, like all good things. Like you might ask if you're in the northeast, where did the, where did the oysters come from? Or where did the um, scallops come from? That kind of thing. So know where you're getting your fish and know what you're eating. Um, and that can help you a lot, as we'll talk about. So this is a cartoon actually from 1980, if you look at the bottom here, from a magazine called The Diversion. And this is about the state of um, ciguatera management in a hospital when you are sick. So um, if it's any consolation, they've taken it off the menu. But there's actually still very little that you can do to help somebody that's had ciguatera. There are a few things um, that can help with the symptoms of ciguatera, but this is an illness that is very severe and lasts for a very long time. So in an acute phase, if you had that nice piece of grouper that was in the last picture and it had ciguatoxin in it, you could be sick, you could be in the ICU for one to two weeks and then you could have recurring symptoms for about six weeks to eight weeks. And then 20% of people that have that acute illness will go on to have a chronic illness that can last for 10 to 20 years of their life. That happens because the toxin actually damages the immune system or the autoimmune system. And the, our autoimmune systems can't repair themselves very well. So you get this effect. Um, it's not actually the toxin coming back into your body through time or being released through time. It's just um, the fact that you've been damaged by that toxin the first time. Having said that, I've been in lots of different um, islands throughout the Caribbean where people are pretty proud to say that they have had ciguatera 20 or 30 times. Um, but it doesn't actually make it better. So people don't tend to become resistant or immune to ciguatoxin. We don't build up antibodies, we think, um, based on the current evidence at least. We don't build up antibodies to um, protect us from those effects. But we're working towards trying to understand what we can do to try and alleviate the symptoms um, and the severity of those illnesses. So um, again, I thought I'd show you some old stuff because it's much like the new stuff. <laughs> um, this is actually a figure and I, it's one of the only graphs in my presentation, so don't worry, I've got videos and other cool stuff um, to look at. But um, this is from the American Journal of Tropical Medicine in 1979 and it pulled up, um, over 3,000 cases of ciguatera from the 60s to the late 70s and put together sort of the symptomology of what people experience. And so, at least in this one, I've seen people certainly get um, sick within 20 to 30 minutes. That seems more common. But here they've got about three hours where they get some diarrhea and vomiting, so gastrointestinal problems. And then you get this launch from about 12 hours of like pain and sensory effects because the toxins that cause ciguatera are actually neurotoxins. And they're affecting sodium channels on your nerve cells. So when those signals are broken, it actually causes a bit of chaos and cells start to lyse, they start to break open and die. And that causes numbness and tingling sensations. 
um, and this um, fairly extreme pain. You can get a bone pain and a muscle pain, and that lasts for a very long time. So these parathesias and myalgia are those tingling, numbness, and, the m and um, pain. And the pruritus comes a bit later, about you know, a full day in. This is an itching. So it's an itching that you can't scratch. I don't know if you've ever had that itching in your feet, and it feels like it's deep in your feet and you can't actually scratch it. That itching is intense um, and considered to be the worst symptom of ciguatera because people need to plunge themselves into an ice bath to make it stop. It's not something that can be fixed with, um, I'm going to fix this a minute. It's not something that can be fixed with um, antihistamines because this is not an allergic response. So um, anyway, the important thing, these things happen and then they keep happening and this is like a flat line and it's not going down, right? So these things can last for many, many weeks and um, months in some cases. Um, so it's a... It's an important thing to work on. People care about it, we care about the people that have this illness, and we want to try and avoid it at all costs because we are seeing it expand in range and severity throughout the world. So, where in the world? So, the most toxic places that we thought Ciguatera existed was really surrounding the equator, in the, the equator, in the true tropics, but that's been expanding through time and continues to expand. And then we've seen lots of pop-up cases in northern hemispheres where we never expected it to be. And also into southern hemispheres, so we have some recent cases in New Zealand. Um, so maybe Chauncey, you can check that out, <laughs> get the details for me. <laughs> but um, up in North America, so I've worked on cases um, out of New York, the Brooklyn markets um, that had a lot of toxic fish being sold there. But these are typically still going to be cases where fish have been imported from tropical regions because tropical regions, tropical waters are very rich in fisheries, right? So nice, warm, dense water, lots of food for those fish to eat. Um, so there's a lot of import-export um, going on and that trade is linking to some of these illnesses. Those that happened in the United Kingdom, Germany and the Netherlands actually were all based on fish that were purchased um, or harvested in the Indian Ocean, and those um, on, yeah, I guess it's, it's a world map that where I'm usually got Australia in the middle, but that's all right. Um, <laughs> but all around Japan, um, they've got uh, a really dense um, problem with Sigraterra. So they actually have an endemic problem there that doesn't seem to be linked to the mainland, which is quite interesting, but anyway. So that's what it looks like. Let's zoom in to the Caribbean for a minute because that's where we are. And you'll see that all of the coastlines covered here have had um, reports of ciguatera. Before coming to work at a university, I worked um, on outbreaks of ciguatera all over, all over the place and was um, deployed when people were sick to try and help them in the hospital and help doctors respond. And um, so many of these places where the lines are are, li are places that I've being physically in a hospital with somebody, talking to them and trying to help them. Um, having said that, this doesn't mean that every coast of every place and every island has ciguatera. It doesn't mean that there's not safe places to catch great fish that you can eat safely. So um, the thing we're trying to work out as part of our research is where is it safe? Under what conditions is it safe? Can we predict that? Can we model that? Can we, can we help people manage it so that we can have greater assurance and a greater um, experience when we're um, at a restaurant eating those fish because nobody wants to make anyone sick. Certainly not the fishermen because they want their livelihoods, right? So, and we've worked with fishermen in many of these places as well because they know more than we do, for sure. So we're not going into these areas knowing everything at all. <laughs> um, we rely on the eco ecological knowledge of fishermen in those regions to help us out so that we can try and get to understanding the source because they understand the vectors quite well. They know what they are, they know where they're moving. Um, so it's been a really great relationship all over the place actually. So a really good experience. You'll see up, oops, wrong button, this button. <laughs> Um, up and down the United States, so on the east and west coast of Florida, of course, we have cases pop up here. Also in the northern Gulf of Mexico, um, 
along even where we are in Alabama, which is right here. We see cases popping up now all of the time. And um, also in off the flower garden banks here, which is a really deep reef system, um, but lots of toxic fish here that we've worked with um, the flower gardens quite a bit, causing illnesses that end up in Texas. So you'll see it's a big problem, but um, we're trying to manage it. So there's some good news at the end of this. It's not just a dark tale that, you know, of despair and, oh, no, never eat the fish. It's going to be, <laughs> I love fish, so we're going to keep eating the fish. But where does it come from? What is the problem? For many, many years, um, it was thought that ciguatera was caused by a problem on the bottom of the ocean. So about something like copper plating, heavy metals and things were thought to be coating the seafloor and that that was causing this illness that progressed. And, uh, and honestly, that, that makes a lot of sense if you, don't, if you don't know, because a lot of the symptoms associated with heavy metal poisoning look a bit similar to what you see with Ciguatera. So um, not so surprising. But now we know that it's actually the... I did it again. Okay. I've got to stop you trying to use the pointer. What we know now is that it's actually these itty bitty cells. And this was a video which may not play, but um, anyway, these itty bitty cells here are called gambrodiscus. They are benthic dinoflagellates. So these are microscopic algae that can actually swim around. It's a bit hard to see in this picture, but they have flagella. So two stringy tails that hang off them and allow them to whip them around so that they can move a little bit in the water column. But they can't really swim l large distances and they can't swim against the current. And these guys are actually really fat as far as microscopic algae go. They're really big boys. And they don't move very fast. So they're massive, massive cells, kind of just big blobs. And they look like bumper cars, actually, just moving around when you have them under a microscope. Um, and the students are laughing because they, they know, like they look at these and we all laugh at them and we talk to them like they're our children. <laughs> um, but they live on the surface of macroalgae. So this is some macroalgae. This is a um, variety of different macroalgae here. We've got dictyota and a few other things. But this fuzzy stuff that you're probably ignoring when you're diving, you're like, oh, let me get past that so I can see something good. But um, on the thallus of these, so sort of on the, you could think of it like the stems, if you think of something in your garden, um, they live on the surface of that. And they produce this sticky mucus to attach themselves and hang out there. And so the biggest problem in their day is trying to find enough space to live in that. But they can form strings and tendrils and they can hang off in the water column and just float on a hammock. Doesn't sound too bad. But um, they're typically associated with that cell. But they can break free of that and they can swim around a little bit. And if we have a disturbance event, like a storm or a hurricane or something like that, or even just high wave action, that can shake these up a lot and push those cells off. Um, and so they can move to new areas when that happens. So that's something to keep in mind. So this is just another way of looking at the under the microscope, just to see, again, this is like the main part of the macroalgae. And this is all the little cells that we've stained with some um, calcifloor. It's just a blue dye, fluorescent dye, to try and see the surface of all of those cells just sticking out. But you'll see they're not sticking to it directly. They're just they're in their mucus layer like a cozy blanket that they've pulled up and they're hanging out there um, quite comfortably. Um, and this is a really high magnification of those cells and what they would look up like really, really close up. But these are teeny, teeny, tiny cells, so you can't see them with your with your eye, unless they're in big clumps. And this is why we care about them. So again, I'm not going to give a chemistry lesson today, but they are incredible. I am completely fascinated and in awe of them because they're capable of producing these really impressive molecules. These are, this is actually the largest small molecule that's not a peptide which some of those who you, you might be remembering back to high school or college or something, what that means. But it's one of the largest and the most potent toxins on the planet and being produced by these microscopic algae that are hanging, hanging out in their cosy blanket. 
So what are they doing? Why are they making this? We have absolutely no idea. What we do know is that <laughs> it takes an incredible amount of energy to make those toxins. So mitotoxin is one of them that they're making. And then they have these ciguatoxins that are causing ciguatera poisoning. So it's like a little caterpillar. This is the Caribbean isoform, or the Caribbean variant. And um, this is the one that we're seeing. We didn't know for a long time if, the, if these particular organisms, the gambiodiscus, were actually producing these toxins in the, in the Caribbean. Nobody had ever shown that until our, our group just stumbled upon it earlier this year. So we now know that this species is the most potent toxin producer in the Caribbean. And we also worked out the toxin that it's producing. So now we have something, we can track that now. That acts like a marker, it's like a beacon that we can look for um, throughout all different organisms and all different places. But there's a number of other compounds that they produce. So they also live with other organisms. So you'll see uh, they don't all look the same over here in the corner, right? I've got little green ones and little round ones over here, tiny ones that are much smaller. These all live in the same community. So they live in the same neighborhood. They hang out, they work together, doing what? We don't <laughs> quite know. But we're very interested because they're all capable of producing really interesting metabolites, which is what we call these, these secondary metabolites. So that means they're not using these as a primary function for their life or their physiology. They're using it for something else. And they're actively doing it. And they're still doing it. And they've been doing it forever. So why, why are they putting so much energy into producing these things? It doesn't only take a lot of energy, it takes a lot of time to produce these. So for a defense mechanism or an anti-grazing response, the molecules would be much smaller. You would be looking at something this big and not massive like this. Anyway, we, um, through collaborators and students, this is the work of a student, Katie Pitts from Woods Hole, have developed some methods to look for these cells um, with different stains so you can, based on their DNA, we can work out exactly which species they are. That helps us because not all species are as toxic as the other. And so we can put a, a DNA probe on them that fluoresces under um, light, and then you can count how many of each type that you have in a particular sample. So, okay, we're not going to go too much into that. We're going to look at why do we need that information. It helps us because this is the Florida Keys here, and St. Thomas and the Virgin Islands, we're then able to map different reef systems to see the prevalence of that really toxic one, which was Sylvae, this dark blue one here. So in the, in the little pie charts, these are from Mindy Richland um, from Woods Hole. If you look for the dark blue bars, you can see that they're producing, so they have that Sylvae present quite a bit of the time at these sites, but they're not dominant, right? Like there's lots of this light blue one and the light green one, so Carabaeus and Carolinianus. So they're dominant. Those are the ones um, that pe people, you would think, should care about because there's more of them. But we have found that there's a huge variability in their, in their um, toxin production. So not to go into too much detail, but this is on a log scale, so every increment is about tenfold different. So these ones, enough to say that the Carabaeus here, that was the dominant species, and this sylvae that's over here are a hundred times different. And I had to use this wonky scale so that they would fit on the same plot. Otherwise, it would be through the roof. But um, so the sylvae are capable of producing quite a lot of toxin, um, so we're very interested in them. And these were not producing toxin in the Florida Keys, only throughout the Caribbean. So it's very interesting to understand that. So what does that mean? If we took one cell, of the Gambrioidiscus sylvae, it would be equivalent in toxin production to a thousand of those other Carabaeus cells. So you really only need one of them to be um, causing problems on the reef system. So kind of interesting. So the things we're doing and the questions we're asking are really, where are they living? So where are Gambrioidiscus? What, what habitat do they prefer? Is it the Halameda that you might see when you're diving on the reef? That's the um, thicker one that's often got um, some 
crustose on it, you know, like calcium carbonate sort of material with it. Dictyota, which is a brown, sometimes red, fluffier one, really light texture. Or the turf algae, which is like the one centimetre fuzz that you see all over the rocks and rubble and other things. Um, we know that fish really prefer to be grazing on all of that turf, but Dictyota has a lot more of um, these benthic algae. So uh, we're trying to understand, does the gamerodiscus, does the presence of that change the palatability? So how tasty these macroalgae are to fish? Um, and can they sense it at all? And then trying to understand through light, waves, and water temperature, and other variables, how that might be influencing their growth and toxin production. So then I just wanted to touch on the usual suspects here that end up with these toxins. So we've got all those fish grazing on all those macroalgae and seagrasses and other things. Um, so these are some of the fish that you might have heard of being associated with ciguatera. So barracuda, maybe the red hind, snappers, um, other, other groupers and jacks, um, and triggerfish and hogfish, um, at least in the upper Caribbean, so Puerto Rico. Hogfish are the main suspect in um, St. Thomas, triggerfish, the queen triggerfish particularly, is one of the main suspects. But people always like, you know, the king mackerel and barracuda always seem to be um, very toxic. So if you were going to choose a fish, any fish, not just the fish that I have on the screen here, which one would you think would be producing the most toxin on the reef? Any thoughts? The barracuda, which one? Parrotfish. It's a really good. It's a really good option. It's a good choice because it's grazing all the time. Any other takers? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Definitely some mesopredator, something that's going to come in and chomp the grazers. Any other thoughts? Shark, yeah, shark would be a good apex predator, cleaning out everything. Anyone else want to have a guess? Conk, yeah, conk are really good grazers, so they'd be, yeah, going through the seagrass. And we have had a lot of ciguatera cases with conk in some areas. They tend to actually avoid some of the areas that are dense with, cigu with um, these gamberodiscus, though, which is interesting. So maybe they sense it, and so that's another PhD project for somebody. <laughs> Right, guys? <laughs> um, so actually, the most toxic fish I've ever analysed on a reef is this little guy. And will it start the video? Yes. So if you've ever seen one of these little guys, a the little damselfish, he's like one of the best gardeners on the reef system, right? He guards his little patch of turf algae. And will actually, I know is. This is me on snorkel, so just excuse the bobbing a little bit. But um, guarding his patch of algae, and they'll actually move little pieces of sand and rubble and anything they don't want, and they'll actually pick the cells, the microscopic algae that they want to be in their garden. Um, they're also really long-lived, so we've aged these fish up to 50 years. So because they're so old, and they're in their little garden and they don't move away from their patch for most of their lives, they can actually on a per gram basis, so based on their body weight, be the most toxic fish on the reef. So then, as Lynn suggested, the next fish that eats him, if they ate all of his family, which would be really sad because they're adorable, but um, <laughs> could become very, very, very toxic. You actually age them in the same way you might a bigger fish. So you can take their um, ear bones and we can... S um, oh, I'll repeat the question, I'm sorry. Um, the question was, how would we age a damselfish, something so small like this? Um, and we, we actually pull their little ear bones um, out and then you can section them and look at um, the... It's sort of like the rings on a tree on those sections and each one um, is an considered an annualized, so it represents a year of growth. But um, yeah, so you can, it's quite, it's actually quite easy as it turns out. Yeah, that's unfortunate we can't do it and keep them living, but yeah. <laughs> but um, Liz, who's over here, has been aging all sorts of things um, for quite a while, so she can give a demo. <laughs> 
Anyway, um, so just to recap on some of this, we've got the Guillermo discus blown up here, living on the macroalgae with fish eating and grazing. You'll also see a lot of tang and other surgeon fish, doctor fish, those sorts of things, grazing all day long. You have these other um, predators coming in and eating those fish um, and so on. And we always talk about the barracuda, but let's not forget some of these other important grazers that could be vectors as well for something like triggerfish and hogfish that are coming and eating those. Um, and they can be quite toxic as well. But what I wanted to talk about is that a common misconception is that this would work like mercury, where you see biomagnification, where all the really big fish are gonna have the biggest loads of toxin. And it's actually not the case. We see very little difference on a relative scale from the little guys all the way up to the apex predators. But we do see a change in the types of toxins in their tissues because they're modifying them, changing them um, through time, just through metabolism like we would. So you eat something, you're gonna change something with the acid in your stomach. And all different fish have all different ways of metabolizing things. Um, so those can vary quite widely on the reef, um, which can be important. But there's weak evidence of that biomagnification. So a shark, as it turns out, is not um, going to be all that toxic unless it's a highly resident species feeding in a very toxic area for, for a very long time, and then that might be the exception. So how do we detect toxins? So you can't really just look at it and know that it's toxic. Um, although some fishermen do tell me stories that fish will not fight as hard when they have um, ciguatoxin. So when you're pulling in a barracuda or a king mackerel, they say that if they don't fight, you throw it back because it would be toxic. So throughout Cuba, that's the rule that they use. Um, and they have very few cases of ciguatera, so maybe they're onto something. Um, but for a long time, people thought there were no effects um, of ciguatoxins in fish, and we're going to talk about that. There are traditional methods of detection. People use ants, um, boiling the fish with a coin. The coin could go black. Um, putting a piece of fish out, and if uh, the flies don't land on it, then that's considered you know, toxic. And these are a bit hit and miss in how well they work. But um, the things that do work really well is feeding it to your cat or to a mongoose in Hawaii. Or, and I don't recommend that, don't recommend that. But it's effective. Um, <laughs> so what do we do that's actually really complicated? These toxins are very, very toxic, but they're present at really low levels. So they're trace level toxins present. Um, causing a lot of problems. So it's like looking for a needle in a haystack um, when you do this. So it's actually fairly complex chemistry that we have to do to um, pull out those toxins. So um, all of the people here, they, they dive and they cut out fish ear bones and they do all sorts of things, but they also know how to do some pretty complicated chemistry, which is pretty cool. So pretty smart people over there. Pretty proud of them. Um, so I'm not going to go into all of those methods because we would be here for days explaining the physics of how it works. But um, I thought I would stop if you had any questions. I'm taking the lead from the other guys doing the, the mid-question review. Um, yes? Yeah, so the question is, um, what is causing the ciguatera or the spread of these cells, um, these algae through the world where it started in the um, sort of around the equator and is moving and what are the drivers of that? So we do know something about that. So it turns out that these cells, um, they like to be cozy and warm, but they don't like to be hot and things are getting hotter. And so we're seeing um, a lot of change and the other two speakers that spoke uh, earlier in the week um, talked a little bit about this too. But the environmental changes that we're seeing are causing all sorts of organisms to move and they're moving to northern and southern latitudes, right? They're moving out. And they're doing so not only um, with changing habitat. And so macroalgae, for instance, is growing over reefs that are degraded, that have bleached. 
Um, they tend to, tend to outcompete everything else um, because they don't require very much. Nutrient pollution will help the substrate grow, but the algae, the, so the microscopic algae themselves, are not driven by nutrients. So they don't. All of the experimental evidence that we have and the field evidence shows that they don't change at all in the presence of nutrients. So it's not human pollution and waste and nutrients that are causing their growth and proliferation. But the nutrient pollution um, and eutrophication is causing macroalgae growth. So there's more habitat for them, if that makes sense. So they've got more places where they can live, but they don't necessarily need all of the nutrients that are there. So if, if the macroalgae weren't the problem, these algae wouldn't be the, these microscopic algae wouldn't have a problem either. So, and that's changing through time. So some of the, the most toxic species we know actually likes much cooler temperatures. So things are getting too warm for them in the tropics. We're seeing them in the northern Gulf of Mexico quite happily growing um, and producing toxins up there. So that's some of the snippets anyway. We'll talk about some more. Yes, over here. Yeah. So the question is, does the way you prepare your fish affect the toxicity of the fish? Not really. So it, it can, and I hear lots of stories where people will skin the fish, and if you skin the fish and take the bones out, you are going to take a significant portion of the toxin out. But you're not going to get rid of it, because once a fish has this toxin in its system, it does distribute it throughout its body and into the fillet, into the flesh that we would eat. But um, cooking doesn't affect the toxin, it's extremely stable. So we can put this at a, a 150 to 200 degrees Celsius and it doesn't break down. We c it modifies some of the other variants of it, but it doesn't break it down. So, so it would still be risky, unfortunately. There was a question right here and then I'll go to you. Do yes. The Do the toxins affect any of the fish populations? Yes. We don't have enough evidence uh, in our field scale at the moment. But some of our experiments, um, exposure experiments, where we have fed fish through time a low level dose of the toxin and we've watched what happens, their behavior is significantly affected. So I have a couple of slides on that to show you in a minute. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so the question is, um, are the fish affected? And if they're not affected, what makes the fish different to humans in our ability? Yeah. So the fish, for a long time, everybody said, well, the fish aren't affected because they have the toxin in them and they're still swimming around. But we don't know which fish died, right? So we're seeing the fish that have survived. We're not seeing the fish that might have died or might have moved through the food web as prey. Um, so... There's that aspect, so they are affected, but there are some differences between the way fish deal with the toxins and the way humans do. And I have a couple of slides on that too, coming up. So, but the way they metabolize the toxins is a bit different. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that the question is, if you were eating at a restaurant with your friends, would you all get sick in the same way? Or um, would only one of you, or would all of you get sick? Great question. Um, there's a lot of variability in all of us, right? So any time we're um, taking in some toxin, there's going to be individual variability. And we see that quite often where actually a couple of, there's one, one um, outbreak that I can think of, and an outbreak is when we work with three to five to 20 cases, where the children were actually unaffected, so little kids were unaffected, and the adults were taken out in, in 30 minutes and they were all in hospital. And it's absolutely wild and we're not quite sure why, because based on their size, they should have received more, but they were picky eaters and they didn't actually eat as much, I guess. So um, whereas the adults were eating quite a bit of that fish, but even then, there's significant variability. But that doesn't seem to be a difference between men and women necessarily. It seems to be equal. But um, 
having been pre predisposed with other um, autoimmune diseases can cause significant problems for people. That's something I'm seeing through all of the case reports um, of people that have had ciguatera long term or suffering the effects six months later. Um, so I have seen more, we just don't have enough data from enough people from the Caribbean yet, but women have tended to have these symptoms longer than men. Um, but we need more data, so. Yes, sir. Um, would you say that uh, infected fish only be eat fish from salt water or also sea water? Uh, like fresh water? Yes, fresh water? Yeah, so the question is would fish be affected just from salt water or also from fresh water? These, these are the source of this toxin does not like it below 30 parts per thousand salt, so really salty water. So you'll only find these in salty water. You should not ever find them in freshwater fish. So any problem that looks similar to this in fresh water would likely be something else. So that alone would tell me to look for heavy metals or some other um, toxin or contaminant. But not all salty water, so it might just be um, often the leeward side of islands where there's not much turbulence and mixing because remember I talked about with big waves, it's going to flush these things off and move them away. So a lot of the stronger swimming fish that are able to deal with um, wave action and turbulence um, are often a lot less toxic or non-toxic. Yeah? So um, the question was, um, this gentleman is going to have some, lo really, really wants to have some lobster later, and I don't blame you, um, but wondering if lobster and shrimp would also have this issue. So we have seen um, ciguatoxins in lobster um, around the place, but that's because they're they can get pretty big and they're eating smaller organisms that are grazing on the algae. So they're not themselves grazing on the algae, but they are eating little, all the little things that are grazing. But shrimp are a bit different. So shrimp are detritivores and often eating on decaying things. So it depends where you get your shrimp and what kind of shrimp. But the kind of shrimp that you would be eating in a restaurant are not typically a concern um, for Ciguatera. So. Oh, so many questions. OK, yeah. Come on. Yes. I love it. <laughs> Yeah, so the question is, do we also find in cooked fish and in raw fish, is it like fugu um, or puffer fish toxins where you can maybe isolate where the toxin is and move it out and then and be safe? Not quite like that, no. Um, so because it's part of their diet, um, they're bringing that up through their gastrointestinal tract, just like we do, and they're using all the protein from all of the things that they're eating, and they're distributing that throughout their bodies, and the toxins go with that. So, yeah, we don't, we don't really find a difference between raw and cooked food, but when we do cook the fish, we sometimes see a little bump in toxicity, but that's, that's because all of the other forms of the toxins have been converted by the heat treatment. Frozen sea so the question is, what about frozen seafood? Um, freezing the seafood doesn't change anything either, so it's just really stable. It's like really awesome chemistry. Like you've got a, these little microscopic algae, like what are they doing? It's insane. But they're producing this really complex compounds that are really <laughs> extremely stable. It's, it's fascinating if it wasn't a little bit concerning health-wise. It's just fascinating. So we sit that in that place as a scientist, like, it's so cool, what are they doing? I'm like, why? This is awful, you know? <laughs> okay, one more question. Since it's such a strong toxin, is there any potential medical, like, good purpose? Yeah, a lot of people are working on that. It's not something I've been working on myself, but a lot of people are trying to capitalise on that very stable compound, yeah. 
the concern is like trying to make sure that it doesn't have lots of side effects. Because when you have, um, when people are preparing or developing chemo drugs, for instance, the goal is to make the compound as simple as possible so that it can then be eliminated from your body pretty quickly. These very complicated molecules are going to, like, they're going to interfere. They're a little bit too big. When we talk about things binding, so you might have a receptor, like a pain receptor, if you wanted to use it as a pain medication. So this toxin might bind to that, and they, they can actually bind to the same channels that are associated with pain. But they might bind, but then you've got that other part of the molecule that you saw. And that would be sort of like a dog wagging its tail and interfering with all of the other receptors on the cell surface. So, but if you chop a piece of it off, so there's some really great chemical engineers that can do this and they can enzymatically snip part of the molecule and use a little piece of it, then they might be onto something. So, all right, well, great questions. Love it. All right, we'll move on to a little bit. I wanted to take a little, uh, take it back a little to remind we've got high variability of different substrates. So all macroalgae and turf and seagrass and even rubble and sand, these things can live on. So there's chemistry involved in that and sele selectivity where species are choosing what they eat. And on top of that, you've got these benthic dinoflagellates living on them, producing toxins. Then you've got a variety of different primary and secondary consumers, and it might be parrotfish, like you mentioned earlier, um, gastropods, echinoderms, other things, um, feeding and grazing all of the time. Might include sea turtles, right, that are coming in and munch. We've seen so many sea turtles this week, so I had to bring those up. <laughs> um, and then tertiary computer consumers that have varied diets and varied life histories. Life history meaning where they choose to go, how far they choose to go, what, they choose to, what they're eating, what's available for them, and so on. All of these things are going to be modifying a food web in an individual ecosystem. And then you have mobile vectors. So this is actually easier for us to work on, right? The immobile source. These cells are hanging out on this algae. Sometimes wave action and things can move them around, but they usually like to stay in the same spot, so we can usually find those. And eventually we hope to map these throughout the Caribbean so we can get a grid for people of where there's a, a risky patch and where there's all the safe, the safe sides. But at the top of the food web, you've got these mobile vectors, and some, some fish are able to move 1,500 to 2,000 miles, right? And they're taking, taking the toxins that they may have consumed in one area with them. So if that's why something like barracuda is considered toxic in lots of places, because they do actually move around a lot. They're really good swimmers. Likewise for the amberjacks and other species like that that are highly migratory. Anyway, the things we're interested in is trying to understand how those toxins are biotransformed or modified. If there was biomagnification, which we've actually ruled out at this stage, and how toxic all these fish are, and if there are specific species that would give us a uh, measure or a bioindicator, like some kind of alert um, that an area might be a concern. So there's some of the things we're working on. I thought I would give you a snapshot of some other regions. These are actually four fish that we tracked in, um, well not tracked, but we tested, collected and tested with fishermen in, uh, around, in and around St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. So we have the queen triggerfish, the red hind, a white grunt and a yellowtail snapper here. We collected them from these four areas in the red squares um, around St. John and St. Thomas. So on the south out here on the, um, on the shelf, then to the southwest and then over to the north. And so trade winds are coming this way from, from the north. So where do you think our most toxic spot was for all of these fish? Southeast was, we had a lot of toxic fish there. But the southwest was actually um, more protected because the winds are often coming sort of north, northeast, sort of in this direction. Um, so really, really quite toxic fish here of all, all four species, um, except for one. So the yellowtail snapper was actually very, very low toxicity in all places. For anyone out there who knows their fish diets, can anyone think of why? a yellowtail snapper would be lower toxicity than all the others. Huh? You catch them smaller? Yeah, maybe. 
Well, they're actually planktivores, so they, they're feeding not on the benthos, they're feeding, so on the area on the bottom, they're often feeding in the water column, they're a more pelagic feeder, so their diet, so their life history changes the amount that they're eating. Um, so that's why these things matter. So I go to St. Thomas and I often just choose to get the yellowtail snapper for, <laughs> for a dinner. So there's a point, but we'll try not to overfish them at the same time. Um, so then when you look at the more apex predatory fish, the more migratory fish, this is a plot where we have um, the circles are represented as barracuda, the little pentagons here are cerro mackerel, um, so quite big mackerel, I'm sure you get them around here as well, and then the kingfish or the king mackerel. And the color scale represents the risk rating based on their toxicity that we found. And you'll see now in the north where it was actually a fairly non-toxic zone. I, I guess I didn't mention that in enough detail. But over here, this northern site for these four species, was they were all non-toxic. Um, but when we start looking and collecting these more migratory species, you'll see there's they're popping up all over the place. So there's a few, the green is, um, you know, no toxin detected. And then the varying levels up to red um, are increasing levels of toxicity. But you'll see off the shelf, there's quite a lot of toxin happening up here. This location is unknown because the fishermen didn't want to tell us where exactly they caught those fish. That's all right, I understand. But um, they were quite toxic. Um, anyway, so it just shows you that there are differences and we should think about what the fish which fish they are and where they might be going. So some of the questions, um, I don't have too, too much left, but some of the questions we're asking in my lab relate to um, the toxicokinetics. So this is how fish take up the toxin. So how does it get into their bodies? And then what do they do with it once it's there? So how is it distributed in the tissues? So here, um, it's just a signal of where in the fish does it end up? How do they metabolize the toxins? So do they break them down? Does that help them eliminate them in any way? And then um, the elimination processes. So how long does it take for them um, to move out? Um, and then we also are interested in the behavior, their survival and reproduction as well. Does, do these toxins have an effect on their ability to reproduce? Um, because we do want to know about sustainability of fishes and the impact of populations. Um, but these very fundamental questions are actually unknown, so we've started to tackle them. So what we thought would happen is that we, we actually found fish take up the toxin really, really quickly. So within a week of low-level exposure um, through their diet, just an oral exposure every day of a teeny tiny little bit of toxin that causes no outward signs of problems. So the fish are fine, they're happy, they're swimming. Um, they, within a week, are producing toxins that are at a level that would cause illness if you ate them. Then um, by week three, they've reached a maximum body burden, so their little bodies can't take any more toxin. They're still not acting strange, but they're not accumulating any more. Everything else is just purging straight out of their bodies. So at this point, we thought, and this is the work of my PhD student, Clay, Bennett, um, he proposed this, that, well, they're, gonna, they're going to eliminate it eventually, so we just have to test it and see when it all goes away. Um, so he did that, and then he did that for 14 weeks, and then he kept doing it, and then he realized it's Thanksgiving, and they still had toxins in them, so he had to extend his experiment. Um, what we actually found was that that doesn't happen. So they tend to reach this maximal body burden and then they might get a top-up dose. So instead of they get used to having this body burden and then over time they're able to take up more. So they have a different, different sort of response than we expected. And this is actually up to about 180 days before they start to see a decline. And in that time, if you thought of a reef system, they would have, they would surely in six months be exposed to another patch of toxic algae. So. Um, they would be topped up all of the time. So unfortunately, this, is, this rings true to some of our field data throughout the Virgin Islands where some fish that when we first started working there about 12 years ago, we would see about 30% prevalence. So 30% of 
something like um, the trigger fish would be toxic and now we see almost every fish we test is toxic. So it's quite, quite strange. Yeah. I have no idea what depuration means. Depuration means clearance rate. So the ability to remove the toxin from their bodies. So elimination. Oh yeah, the gentleman asked, he wasn't sure what depuration no, meant. Okay. Before that. Before that. Oh, 30, the wind picked up right then, I think. Nice. Yeah, yeah um, I'll, I'll just repeat the comment I was making. So in fish that we were sampling in the Virgin Islands about 12 years ago, we saw 30% of them would have the toxin in them. And now every fish that we test have the toxin in them in one site. Your theory for that is Our theory is that they're constantly being topped up from the amount that's in the environment. So they're able to... Right. They didn't have as much of the toxin available in the environment before. So it's a complicated story. Yes? Yeah. So the question is, does size matter and the age of the fish matter? So as they're smaller, do they pick up as much as the older fish? And um, some of the answers to that are, it's a little bit complicated, but fish have different diets through their lifetime because as they get bigger, they're choosing different items to eat. So um, the smaller, younger fish are often eating in the benthos a little bit more than um, the, the larger fish. But if they, have, if they live in a certain area for most of their lives, then they might still be preying on fish that have been exposed to the other levels. But it does, size does matter, so the size of the fish can make a difference. But if they have been feeding in an area where these toxins exist, they will still be toxic regardless of their size. So it's not a safe guard. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, that's actually something that we found through this experiment because the experiment was so long, the fish were growing through the time and they actually dilute the toxin through their tissues because they're getting bigger, but the total body burden didn't change. Yeah. yeah. So it's just too simple to say there's so many factors affecting our meat from rising temperatures it's possible but it makes it sound too depressing I think <laughs> but I think I think there are ways to mitigate that right so I think you know we talked about the effects of nutrients and nutrient pollution and those sorts of things before that could reduce the amount of macro algae on reefs potentially so that could reduce the amount of substrate they have to live on um, so that could be one thing. Um, and then honestly, there's lots of, s lots of places on the reef that don't have these toxins at all. So there's a lot of areas that don't. So we're not, you know, the, the jury's not completely out yet, I guess. You know, there are still things that can be done. And through the different um, models we're trying to work on, I think we can predict where those areas are, mitigate those areas, work out what's going on, and then reduce those impacts through time. So, and I think that can be done in our lifetime, for sure. So, we just need the data, and that's a complicated issue to work on. So, yeah. Can they pass the, uh, the toxin directly onto the offspring? Yes. Actually, the question was, can the fish pass um, the toxin onto their offspring? Um, and the answer is yes, um, because the toxins are highly fat-soluble, so they can dissolve into fatty tissue. So, we often find them concentrated in the in the sex organs of fish and in the fatty tissue around them. And when we test the eggs of fish, they are very much loaded with the toxins. So we're, that's why we're interested in what are the effects of those fish as they, as they grow. So I was um, thinking of all sorts of questions when I heard Teresa's talk the other day of like, well, if he's got them in his mouth, like <laughs> <laughs> what's going on? Is his mouth tingling? <laughs> 
Yes. How is the diagnosis made in humans? And the fish that you're sampling here, is that at necropsy? Like, do you have to kill the fish to measure the toxins? So the question is, um, how do we diagnose ciguatera in humans? And then when we're measuring the fish, do we have to necropsy them or dissect them, cut them open to be able to detect the toxins? So part to answer your first question, um, it's a really good one. The diagnosis at the moment is based on recent history of eating uh, reef fish and characteristic symptoms. And those would be um, the gastrointestinal symptoms. You would be asked if you had cooked your fish or not, if you ate your fish raw or not. If you had cooked your fish and you still got sick, then you're likely to, more likely to have ciguatera than a bacterial illness. Um, and then they rule out some other things, like um, scomboid poisoning, which can happen from tunas or mackerels that can spoil. And that can cause a histamine poisoning called scomboid poisoning. That causes rashes, blotchy rashes, rashes mostly on the torso, but that can be alleviated with Benadryl. So, you know, after two or three days, that resolves. But you could get the GI infection and the itchy skin and be thinking, well, I ate this fish and it was off the reef. Um, so that's an often mis misdiagnosis in some places, not usually in tropical places, but in the northern, you know, US, it's usually misdiagnosed that way. Um, the and then char other characteristic symptoms would be the neurological symptoms. Um, so there's a whole list of those and most doctors are really pretty in well informed in tropical areas of those. Um, one of them is called cold, cold allodynia, but people call it hot cold reversal where you might hold a cold can of coke and feel um, like a cold burn um, on their fingers. So that's a fairly characteristic symptom um, of ciguatera. Or a tin, when they drink like a cold tea or water and it tastes um, metallic. Um, so that's another, another one that people talk about quite a lot. But in fish, your second question was, do we have to kill the fish to test the toxin? We often do, um, but we, we can also test their blood. So we can take small blood samples that are non-lethal and we can send them back on their way. Um, but often we're trying to understand a bit more about where the toxins are distributed in their bodies and that kind of thing. So we tend to be fairly comprehensive. So we use every tiny, teeny part of the fish. So if that's, um, that's a positive, I guess. We don't waste any little piece. Every part is tested, right? <laughs> we have freezers to prove it. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we're trying to work on. So that's our end game. Yeah, but well, we're not really in it to make the money. We want to make it as cheap as possible for everybody so that we can get a 50 cent test that somebody could have, have on the dock, right? And just quickly test or on the boat and quickly test that. So um, that's part of our research. So, <coughs> excuse me, when we do these exposure studies, we're also collecting samples for all sorts of other analyses that we do to try and see which pr physiological mechanisms and processes and enzymes and all when you get a blood test at the doctor, you know, they're testing a whole panel of things. We're testing panels of things on all of these fish as well to try and see what's characteristic, what could be a really stable marker of this toxin being present because the toxin is really hard to detect on its own without the complex, very long-winded chemistry. So that's a lot of what we're trying to do. And we're not alone. There's lots of people around the world trying to do that. Well, lots. I think there's four groups trying to do that around the world. It's kind of tricky to do. But I was going to talk a little bit about some good news, some things that we found. <laughs> so, and this is work of another one of my PhD students, um, Jessie Gwynn, who um, couldn't be down with us today because she's already had a couple of tropical trips. Um, but. We looked at how these different species, so we have red snapper, gray snapper, red lionfish, emerald parrotfish, and sheep's head, some of which are found in our area, so f much further north, but um, some of them from more tropical areas. And we wanted to know how do the fish metabolize the toxin. And we actually found that they, oh, it's a weird feedback, I'm sorry. We found that they do this in a really unique way. So they produce these 
glucuronide metabolites. It doesn't matter what the name is, but they put a big sugar on the toxin and that helps them become more water soluble so they can be pushed out with the urine, right? With the excretion mechanisms of the fish. So that's really good news. So we found that across all of these species and actually the ones that did it a bit better were like the parrotfish. Um, so those lower trophic levels, the fish that are grazing. Those That's a really good question. You should come and work with us, I think. <laughs> Great questions. I love it. No, that's a really interesting point. We don't know. So in the environment, we have put passive samplers to try and um, see if there is a collection of material. Um, and we do find it dissolved in the water column or in the water column and getting onto our passive samplers. Um, but we're not sure how stable they are once they've gone through all of these processes. We're hoping that it can fracture a little bit easier and break down. But great, great question. I don't know. It's another PhD. So how are you feeling about a four-year project? <laughs> anyway, so these species are able to do it, right? And these, But these are all coral reef fishes. Um, they live on reef systems already. We then decided um, to test this. And this, this work was done with the enzymes in the liver of these fish. So it's, I won't go into all of the details, but we decided to look in another species. So we went with Atlantic salmon to see how, how conserved this was across all fish. So in Atlantic salmon, this was actually um, salmon from up in Norway. So a long way from any prior exposure to these toxins. And it turns out they do it too. So they're also capable of doing this. So even if we see the movement of these toxins to northern hemispheres or southern hemispheres, there's hope, right? Because these fish do have a mechanism of trying to get rid of it. So that's the good news. So if we can remove it from the, from the environment a little bit more, then the fish would be able to start eliminating it a little bit better. Also test positive for this toxin? No. So the question is, am I saying that the Atlantic salmon also test positive for the toxin? And the answer is no. These salmon are capable when we expose them to the toxin, so we on purpose expose them to the toxin, they are capable of, produce, of metabolizing them in this way. So... But in their environment, no, they're not exposed to it. So we're saying it's good news because it means that fish that are very different from coral reef fish are also able to, uh, to process the toxin a little bit. So if the toxin moves to another place, it suddenly has other fish that are available, right? Not just these fish. Do you fish? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Definitely. But then we tested, we looked for this, um, so we then looked in mammals, right? We looked in a rat model um, and also in humans and um, mammals are not able to do this. So this could be why we still have more, um, more data to gather, but it, it could explain why humans are so much more affected than fish. But are fish affected? Fish are affected. Um, so this is a... This is, um, I'm going to show you just really quickly, there's just two more slides left really, but we did these exposures and we looked at their beha the fish behavior. This is what a normal fish would look like. This is a heat map and where the, the really hot spots are, this is where the fish is at the moment, but he's moving throughout this container, throughout an aquarium. We have a camera underneath and we watch their movements. And so it starts to look like this and I have a video as well, so it will make more sense when I show you the video. But the control fish fed regular diet, no toxin at all, look like that. And then, a and, and then a ciguatoxin diet, so one where we've exposed these fish to toxins, looks like this. So we call this thigmotaxis. It doesn't really matter, and you'll see the little fish here. But that means that they're hugging the walls of their container. And fish do this on the reefs as well, and they can hug the reef system. But that's a very strange behavior in this, in this particular scenario. So they, they are affected and they're acting a little bit strange. To further that point, we'll look at these. So 
I'll take you through this a little bit. The fish have been fed for 28 days, a very, very low level of toxin or a control diet where they have no toxin at all. So in this side here is the control diet, so they've had no toxin. And over here, they've had the ciguatoxin diet, very low level. Then we're going to start the experiment, so they're allowed to show you how they're behaving before anything happens. And then we make an auditory stimuli, which is actually a mouse trap on the, on the side um, of this whole arena. And then LED light is going to show up here. And it's not very fancy. This is duct tape with a little electrode that we've hooked up. So it's not that fancy. But a red light will go off. And then that means that the fish is receiving a stimulus. And we're measuring their behavioral change after that just to see how their nervous system you know, is working, that kind of thing. So we'll look at the control fish. So he's swimming through his arena. We're looking underneath him from this view. Then you see the stimulus. He's scared a little bit. So we call this a startle response, where we've startled him a little bit. But then he starts swimming normally again. So now let's look at this, the one that was had the diet of ciguatoxin. Before the stimulus is clearly acting strange, right? And now that the stimulus has happened, you'll see how rapidly he is swimming. So clearly causing some changes in their behavior. And we've done all sorts of experiments like this. I just wanted to show you a little bit of that. So what do you think would happen if a fish was acting like this on a reef? You think they'd be safer or more likely to be eaten? Mm -hmm. That's true. He's also acting, like making himself very visible by acting very strangely. So, yeah. So it's, it's good and bad. I, th I think likely to be very quickly a prey item compared to this guy because they're struggling so much um, with whatever is going on. Anyway, we're trying to understand those behavioral effects and the cast all the different things that are going on in the fish, but there's clearly a physiological response that happens with low level exposure. And then just to finish off, I thought I would show you how we might look at these things in other, in other regions. So where we are in the northern Gulf of Mexico, um, these algae, these microscopic algae are also being found down to about 100, 200 feet of these massive gas platforms that we have in the northern Gulf of Mexico. It's about 3,000 gas platforms um, providing habitat and mini ecosystems. So we're diving under the water to show you what some of the um, legs of these platforms look like. So you'll see lots of sponges and echinoderms, certainly lots of barnacles. And if you look to the side, you'll see all sorts of fish. And what we're doing here is um, putting artificial substrates on the legs of these uh, rigs to try and see what settles there so that we can keep a record through time of um, the benthic algae coming to these sites. So this is actually just artificial turf that you might find in a golf course and it provides a, you know, like an artificial seagrass for them to attach to. And then we clip those off over a week and two weeks and a month and three months to try and see um, the differences in which, which microscopic algae have joined the, par the party, so to speak. Um, anyway, I'd like to thank um, all of the people that contribute to this work, including CN Learn for providing an opportunity for us to be here. Um, we have lots of partners, as I mentioned before, and lots of um, funding um, for this work and for the students that do much of this work. So thank you very much. Do you want me to keep that playing? Okay. If there are extra questions, you're I'm happy to take them. But we, yeah. Yeah. Are you finding that things are more because of their, their own diet of raw fish and everything else? Mm 
So the question is about um, ciguatera that's being found around Japan. Um, and if their diet, so choices of raw fish and other, other things, um, is influencing the effect there. So they might be getting more poisoning because of that. And a high reliance on seafood in their diet. Yep. Um, so there's a lot of um, fantastic, probably the, the best and most established ciguatera researchers in the world are in Japan. And they um, have been, they were the first actually to isolate the toxins from the Pacific. So they have led the way in that. So they're very much on top of it, but for the very reason that they don't want um, these things to affect um, their diet and livelihoods and that kind of thing. But um, tunas actually don't tend to accumulate as much um, ciguatoxin as other fish, um, probably because of their highly migratory lifestyles. But I'm not a tuna expert, but we do have a tuna expert. <laughs> yeah? Endothermy? Yeah. Do you want to explain that? All right. You can ask Laya. Laya is a student in my class, but she's a student, a PhD student at our university with a fisheries, another fisheries professor. And she's been working on tuna, yellowfin tuna, for a decade probably, right? Yeah. So she knows all the questions about tuna, where I'd be lost. <laughs> big, big fish taste good. That's about all I know. Yes. a really great question. Yeah, the question is, um, do we know how long ciguatera has been around? Like, is this an ancient problem um, that has been here forever or is it new? Um, it depends who you talk to. Um, I, think, I think it must be very, very old, right? Um, a lot of communities, so people have thought, people used to think that Hawaii was a hotspot for ciguatera, and it is, so you, ciguatera exists there in the um, northern Hawaiian islands, it's quite prevalent. But in talking to the um, Pacific Hawaiian folks there, it seems new to them. So to them, it feels like it's been around maybe for 100 years. And throughout the Caribbean though, we have much longer stories and much longer histories. Um, and also into French Polynesia and the South Pacific, much longer histories and much longer, lo much longer stories, where um, as long as they have had language, they have known about Ciguatera. So um, certainly a very long time. And these organisms are very, very ancient and very exclusive. They're kind of an exclusive group of organisms, so we do think they have been around for a very long time. Have they always been producing toxins, though? Don't know. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, um, we may not know why they're producing these fancy, um, very expensive toxins, but do, do I have any ideas of what they might be using them for? Um, I th no, I have no idea. <laughs> All of my theories, you know, I think I started about, I don't know, uh, 12 years ago thinking about this and all of my theories have been debunked. Like everything I thought they were doing with the toxins, they're not doing with the toxins. So that's I'm... Right, that's, that's science in action where you're, yeah. 
Yeah. But um, we think, so one, one way of thinking about it is all organisms are using chemicals and secondary metabolites. Well, we don't know really because they're secondary metabolites. So let me three think that. Chemical signaling in the ocean and chemical ecology is one of the most important ways that organisms communicate with each other and how they decide where they're going to live, what they're going to eat, who they're going to have as a mate, all those kinds of things. Um, so I, I think it's in the chemical ecology, so how they may be communicating with each other. But, but all of the ways I've looked at that have not worked. So... Um, we'll keep trying and we hope to find out one day, but more importantly, we want to protect um, human health from the, you know, people from these toxins as much as we can. Yeah, but good question, because I don't know the answer, so if you have any theories, throw them my way and I'll get some people on them. Thank you very much.